Well, we, uh, this morning, we're continuing going through Matthew. Uh, we're still in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, I was, uh, this, before we uh, started this morning, I was just talking with Forrest and saying, it's just so crazy, Jesus' first sermon, uh, first public sermon that we know of. And uh, he's, uh, he's going easy on the people. We're just going to talk about lust and um, bitterness and we're gonna talk about divorce and remarriage. And now today we're gonna to talk about money. Now, the thing about that's different between me and Jesus, I'm giving you guys a week's rest in between each topic. But Jesus just goes one after the other in his very first sermon. And I was sharing with Forrest a, a quote from a guy named Leonard Ravenhill, who uh, said this, he was a, a teacher pastor. He goes, if, if Jesus taught the types of messages that pastors teach today, he never would have been crucified. And that is just so true. When you see what is on the TV, when you see what's in the Christian bookstore, if Jesus taught that message, no one would have crucified him, right? And so here we have Jesus, though, in his first public sermon, he is just going after the heart, going after the jugular with us, going directly after the things that so just grip our hearts, you know, with lust and anger and bitterness and, and all these things. And so here, we're gonna, he's going to continue the onslaught and we're gonna have the money sermon today. This is the sermon that no pastor looks forward to, but I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm actually really excited about today. I'm, I'm really excited to actually be looking at this with you guys because I believe that the Lord has been doing a great work in your hearts and, and, and I know that we usually bristle at this and everyone thinks, oh, churches just want my money and all this stuff, but, uh, but this is so important for us. And we have to understand this, that we all have blind spots in our life, don't we, right? And if you think you don't, it's because you can't see them, all right? So you do, I promise, you have blind spots. And usually, this is how we kind of can get a, a picture and idea of where our blind spots are a lot of times, is when a certain topic comes up, when you kind of feel that defensiveness come up, you know, or you start saying, oh, but what about this? And you start kind of coming up with reasons and excuses, usually that's your blind spot that's being awoken a little bit, Usually. And so, so today when we talk about this, there's, you're going to get a little uncomfortable probably. And, and I, want to, I want to ask you guys to look at and, and believe that conviction is actually a gift of God. Uh, don't, don't fight against conviction. Conviction is a very, very good thing, even to the point, literally, it is a gift. If God begins to convict you this morning through the Holy Spirit, uh, give him thanks for that. Okay, because there is something in there, there's some blind spot, there's some idol that needs to be uprooted out of your life, some idol that needs to be toppled over, and we're gonna, our flesh is going to want to defend what we're currently doing with our life. And so even these last few weeks, as we've looked at anger, we've looked at uh, lust, we've looked at divorce, we've looked at all these things, uh, we're going to naturally push back on these things if we've either done these things or we're currently doing them or we feel like we're justified in them. So as we get into today, um, just remember that we all have blind spots, and our blind spots do not want to be exposed. And I'll tell you this, too, as we get into today, uh, I've, I've said this before, but just so you guys know, when I come up and preach, my, my prayer, my hope is that I'm always preaching a loftier message than the one I'm living out. Okay, so what I preach is not necessarily always what I practice. I, I, I wish it wasn't the case. Okay, but if I only preach Joby's standard of righteousness and what Joby's doing in his life, then I, I'm, not, I'm not bringing the real gospel to you guys. Right? I'm in this with you. Right? I struggle through things too. I have my own idols and, and little gods that I'm trying to topple over. Right? This is a journey we're on together. Now, people call that, well, that's, that you're being a hypocrite. Well, that's, Jesus is not just my crutch. He's my full body cast. All right? He's my life support. All right, so, so this is something that we are all growing in, and I am constantly, constantly being challenged by the Word of God and by the people in my life, and in the time I, I spend in prayer, I'm constantly being challenged. So, uh, so I'm not coming to you um, in this judgmental way of saying, hey, here's what I do. You guys should be doing the same thing. I'm coming here with you guys saying, guys, this is what Jesus is telling us. All right, well, are we going to believe him, and are we going to obey him together, or are we going to do this? Okay, uh, now I want to start, before we jump into the word and, and with prayer, uh, I want to do a little survey, okay? I'm going to get uncomfortable right off the bat here, all right? 
we're going to do an income survey. Oh, we're already bristling. My goodness. Okay, all right, here we go. Here we go. How many of you guys, I want to see a show of hands. Yep, with your eyes open. All right, yes, really. How many of you guys make more than $365 per year? Okay. You make more than 1 billion people on this planet. Okay, just let that sink in. You make more than 1 billion people on this planet. How many of you make more than $720 per year? Okay. You make more than 3 billion people on this planet. That's half the world's population. Half the world's population lives on exactly $2 per day. Okay, let, just let that sink in for a second. $2 per day. Now, two American dollars does not equate to $5,000 somewhere else. It's $2. All right, so you can buy two Happy Meals per day, half the world. Okay, that's, that's the reality. All right, $2 does not go further. That's, this is like equivalent here. Okay, so look around the room now real quick. I want you to look around the room. You are sitting amongst half of the world's richest population. Yeah. You are in the upper half of the richest people on the planet. So when we read scriptures about the rich young ruler who came and Jesus said, sell all, and, and we go, well, that's for the rich people. Guess what? We're the rich people. So when we read scriptures about treasures in heaven that we're going to see today and we talk about riches and you think you're not rich because of just how you live compared to your neighbors, but in this world, in this, on this globe, we are the richest people. And, and if we were to go further in that $720, if I was to go into real numbers of what we really make, which I'm not going to, so breathe a sigh of relief. If I was to go into the real numbers that we make, we're in the upper 5% of the richest people on the planet. Okay, so look around and believe you are sitting amongst the richest people on this entire planet. So when it comes to what Jesus talks about riches and money, he is speaking directly to us specifically. This is not for the other people. This is not for the millionaires. It's not for the billionaires. It's not for the Bill Gates of the world. It's for you and it's for me. All right, we have to start there, and we have to believe that this, these texts that we're going to read are for us. We are the richest in the world. Whether you feel like it or not, the fact is, you are. Okay, so I want to pray before we jump into Jesus' words in speaking about riches and money and what we do with them. Lord God, we come to you knowing that you are the giver of all good gifts. We come to you knowing that everything that we have is actually yours. Uh, every dollar we've ever earned was earned because of the brain that you gave us to do the work and the hands that you gave us to do the work. So even the means by which we receive the financial gifts and blessing we have and, and um, sustenance and provision, that's even received by your gifts. So we use your gifts to get your gifts. And yet we act like it's, it's ours and we've earned it and we've done the whole thing and so we owe ourselves for our hard work yet we're actually using all of your stuff to get more stuff. And so Lord, as we look at this text today, these, these words, this sermon that you have given us, Jesus, that you want us to, to recognize that these gifts are yours and you want us to steward them, not own them, but steward them for your kingdom and your purposes. So Lord, I want to pray right now that you would uh, bring that, that conviction from the Holy Spirit that is hard to hear but also is exciting and sweet to our heart because we know that it's leading towards life and real freedom, real joy. I pray that you would soften our hearts as, we, um, as maybe even some of our idols are going to be coming under attack. Lord, help us to believe your words and trust your words, knowing that you alone 
have the words of eternal life. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's open up to Matthew chapter 6. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to be in 1 through 4. Then we're going to skip a few verses, and we'll come back to those next week. Because uh, I'm going to tie together a couple verses that have a similar context. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 says this, Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness, okay, your good deeds, in front of other people in order to be seen by them. If you do that, then you'll have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. So thus, when you give to the needy, notice he says when, not if. There's an assumption here. There's an assumption that, hey, you believers, you guys give to the needy. I know you do because you're believers. All right, that's a given. At least it should be. All right, he doesn't say if. He says when. When you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you, okay? Don't announce to the world. Uh, you, you guys know what name dropping is, right? You know, when you're, when you're like, yeah, you know, the other day I was in a restaurant and I sat next to Val Kilmer and told him I liked his movie. You know, you, you kind of do that type of thing. Well, this is kind of like deed dropping, you know? Like where, so don't, don't sound a trumpet, you know, where you're going, yeah, back when I gave five grand to my church, you know, it was just such a blessing for me to do that. You know, like you do that because you want other people to know what you're giving, all right? So he says, don't do that. Don't, don't sound that trumpet as the hypocrites do. Now, the hypocrite, this word in Greek, it, it, it was a word used for actors, okay? So don't do like the actors do, the, the people who are putting on a face, they're putting on a show, they'd put on a mask, okay? These actors, these hypocrites would put on masks during this, this play that they would do, this acting um, so don't, don't be like the hypocrites that, like they do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. They're doing it for the praise of others. They're deed dropping. Okay, don't do that. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. Now, when you give the needy, again, he says when, not if, when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know even what your right hand is doing. Be so careful about your motive that your left hand doesn't know that your right hand is doing something. I mean, it's you know, he's obviously speaking hyperbolically because that's impossible, right? But he's saying, that's how careful I want you to be about your motive so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So it's always asking, why, is, why am I doing these deeds? Why am I serving these people? Is it for acceptance? Is it because I want thanks? Do I want to be appreciated? Am I getting value out of how much I serve or in what manner I serve. If I serve in a really important way or if I serve in a way that I deem as just menial, are you getting value out of how you serve or how much you serve, the quality by which you serve? Are you, getting, are you doing this so you can have uh, acceptance by people? Are you doing it because you want them to see the mask that you're wearing? Like, oh, look, the good Christian person. Why is it that you serve? Why do you give? Why do you do these things? Now, this is not saying at all that there's no place for uh, corporate or public service, okay? This is clear. I mean, Matthew, or, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, that we already just saw a couple weeks ago, let your light shine before who? Men, right? So we want our light to shine before men. We want our light to be public, but what, what's the purpose for it? It's, it's so that they would uh, see your good deeds, right? So there's the good deeds, so they see your good deeds, but for the purpose of glorifying your Father who's in heaven. Here he's saying, don't do this so that you can be praised by others. Okay, so it doesn't mean there's no room at all for any kind of public service or public uh, recognition or something like that, but it means to check our heart. Are we doing it for the praise of others or are we doing it so that people would glorify our Father who's in heaven? Okay, that, that's what Jesus is getting at here. Okay, so we see that that's very clear that uh, he, he wants our good deeds to be seen by others. So it doesn't just mean, you know, be, try to be, you know, the, the James Bond Christian and always trying to just do secret things. Now, there's a time and a place to do secret things, for sure. And there's a time and a place to let your light shine before men. Okay, and so for us, it's, this is a, a conscious uh, thing that we do. We say, God, uh, show us when my motive is just weird. Now, the thing is this, your motive will always be tainted with a little bit of weirdness. Even in your best day and your best motive, there's still going to be a little bit of, that was pretty sweet, pat in the back. There's always going to be some of that. Okay, there always will be. I think it was Spurgeon who said, Lord, forgive me of even my most holy things. 
that even my, my best deeds or even my most selfless acts that I do, I still have a little bit of selfishness. I still have a little bit of selfish glory. All right, this is just the condition of our human heart that is being sanctified and conformed to the image of Christ. You're always going to have some weird deeds. So the solution, or weird motive, the solution is not to just go, well, my motive isn't totally pure, so I'm just not going to give. My motive, it's not totally right, so I'm not going to serve until my motive is totally right. You're just going to keep putting that thing off until you are perfectly, have the greatest motive. You'll never give, you'll never serve, you'll never do anything because you're always going to have something funky going on in your heart. So the solution isn't just to not do it. The solution is to fight through it and appropriate the gospel. Say, God, I'm going to give. Even though my motive is weird, I'm going to give because I need to learn how to do this. I need my heart to change. So maybe if I just start then, and I start seeing the value in it, then you'll start working in my heart. So uh, Richard Baxter, he was a, a pastor in the 1600s, a Puritan pastor. He says this. I think this is great. I think it's biblical advice. If you can't do it with the joy that you should, okay, giving, giving to the needy, giving to church, serving in church, serving your family, um, all these, any, anything you can think of that's a good God-glorifying thing. If you can't do it with the joy that you should, you're doing it out of obligation, you're doing it out of something. Now, that's not good. I'm not saying that's good to do it just out of obligation or, or something. But he's saying if you can't do it with the joy that you should, do it as, at least as you can. Do it the best of your ability because doing it as you can makes you able to do it better. So it's kind of a Puritan way of saying practice makes perfect in a, in a way where you just you step out and you say, you know what, my motive is totally weird, but I'm going to do this anyway, hoping that God will somehow break my heart. But if you just put the wall up and stand back and you just say, but that's not for me, that's for other people, chances are you're not going to have your heart broken or changed for the things of God. So at least stepping out, acknowledging, whether you see it or not, you might have a blind spot, you don't see that your motive is bad, but you just step forward and God grabs you. I can't tell you how many times, you guys, God has led me in my ignorance. I mean, it's becoming, sadly, my life story. Where, like, I do something ignorantly, thinking it's going to be for one motive, and then I get in there and I go, oh, this is actually why you wanted me to do this. Okay, God, I get it. But I just, I'm just going with what I can see, blind spots and all. I walk into things thinking I'm going to be accomplishing one thing or doing one thing for a certain purpose. Then I find out a totally different reason, and I thank God that he shows me. But I just, I just walk forward in faith and not by sight. At least I try to. Trying just to be obedient to the word of God, even if I'm fighting along the way. Because I believe that the word of God is true. And so my prayer is that I would at least obey God even when I'm fighting. Even when my motive is weird that I would obey, and somehow God would get a hold of me. So I'm going to skip down a few verses here, looking at Matthew 6, verse 19. This is where we're going to get into the, the real thick of it here. 6, 19, he says, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Don't invest in things that are temporary. Don't have that be your treasure, but instead lay up for yourselves treasure. Have your treasure be in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. Make that your aim. Make the most treasured things in your life those things. Invest in those things. For where your treasure is, this is the key, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So a question we have to ask ourselves is where is our treasure? Where do we spend our, our, our mind and our thoughts and our money? What do you spend your money the most on? Because that'll reveal where your heart is, right? I mean, if we're going to take Jesus' word at face value, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So if your treasure is in your house payment, your food, your kids' sports fees, your vacations, uh, your retirement, all those things, okay, now, this is where we're going to start going, oh, yeah, but, right? You're going to start arguing with me in your mind, right? I want to get through all these scriptures, then we can argue afterwards. <laughs> Jesus says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So let's just take a personal inventory, okay, in your mind. Picture your bank statement. Where do you spend most of your money? Right? This is, that's, that's where your treasure is. You're putting your treasure there. Okay? Is it having the new gadget, uh, the new clothes, the certain 
you know, look, the certain appearance, the comforts. Now, does it mean that these things are bad? No, it doesn't mean those things are bad. These are good things. These are gifts of God, but they make terrible gods. Good gifts of God, and they make terrible gods. All right, you start serving money, that's bad. Money itself isn't bad, but when we start serving it, money makes a terrible God. Treasure on earth makes a terrible God. And yet we invest in it because, this is the big question, where is your heaven truly? Is this life actually your heaven? Are you trying to make this life heaven with the comforts, the blessings, the stuff, the recognition, the acceptance? Are you expecting this life here to be your heaven? Or do you truly believe that the real heaven is your heaven? Now start just thinking through your treasures, your, your bank statements, all those things, and go, gosh, you know what? I'm actually expecting that earth is going to be my heaven. Look at the way I'm spending my money. I can, I can see clearly that I have values in these things. Now, again, some of these things are necessary, food, right? So, so we start asking ourselves, God, if you've given me money, if you've given me treasures, how then? Okay, this is where I mentioned a few weeks ago, we tend to separate the blessings of God from the purpose of God. We get money and we just assume, cool, and now I can just spend it on more food or a bigger home or a nicer vacation or whatever. Again, not that in and of itself, those are bad things. But we usually don't ask God first, how do you want me to invest this? We usually just assume because we think it's our money, even though the word says we're stewards, meaning we're just, we're, we're given something to invest, but it's not ours, but we're stewards. We're to take care of this money for, for the master who is God. We usually don't ask him for that insight. We just assume that we can do whatever we want with it. So it's not bad to get those things, but what we should be doing is asking God first, God, what is the purpose? Why did you give me a raise? Is it because you want me to take a family vacation? Maybe he does. Maybe, you, maybe he wants your family to go on a vacation for the first time in five years. Or maybe he doesn't. Maybe he wants you to do something else. Maybe he gave you a raise for a specific purpose that isn't that. Now that's between you and the Lord. I'm, I don't have some rule here. Okay, There's no rule on how to do this. This is where you have to get between you and your God in the Word of God, in prayer, asking people in your life, the Word of God, prayer, and community, saying, hey, I got this raise. What do you think I should do with it? Asking people for that counsel, getting in the Word, getting into a time of prayer, not having our dream life to be expected to be here in this life. But we live our lives in a way that's very obvious to the outside world. They're treasures in heaven. Do you, do you spend your time, your energy, your money in a way where the outside world would look at you and say, there are treasures in heaven? Clearly, I can tell by the way they live. I can tell by the things that they do. I can tell by the way they spend their money. Their treasure is truly in heaven. And they believe that. Can people say that about you and about me? Can they say that about Life Mission Church? That our treasure is in heaven. These are big questions. These are very important questions. These are salvation issue questions. Jesus is going to make that clear for us. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves, really, truly, are we living our lives in a way that is obvious that our treasure actually is in heaven? In your notes, it says this. Now, you guys know I highly despise the prosperity gospel. I don't know if I've made that clear um, the last year and a half, but I can't stand it. But the thing is, here's a reality. Each one of us, we believe a bit of the prosperity gospel, even me. All right, Subtly, subconsciously, somehow we still believe certain parts because we say little things like, God will bless your obedience. Now that's true, but again, when we say that, what we're usually saying is, if you obey, then God will bless you in a way that you like to be blessed. And that's not true. All right, but that, when we say that, that's kind of what we're assuming. All right, so here's what the prosperity gospel tells us. When you give your heart to God, treasure will follow after you. Right Now, on the surface, that doesn't sound too bad. When you follow God, God will bless you. He'll, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Right? That's actually a, that's a verse in the Bible. So subconsciously, we actually believe this. We say, when you give your heart to God, then God will bless you. Treasure will follow after you. But the real gospel says this. When you give your treasure to God... Your heart follows after God. 
Big difference. Look what Jesus said again. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the real gospel says, when you give your treasure to God, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Okay, uh, here, here's, here's an example. You guys, we, me, we take care of the things that we invest money into, right? You buy a new car, what's the worst thing that happens after you buy a new car? First scratch, the first dent, the chip in the windshield, right? If you have an old beater of a car or you just someone gave it to you, whatever, you get that little dent, you go, eh, no big deal. But that new car that you just put a bunch of money into, it happens, you're going, no, we paid good money for this. But the, the cheap car, you go, eh, hey, no big deal. Right, uh, take kids' sports. You know, if you have to go buy a bunch of new equipment for a new sports, kind of a little experiment, I don't know if they're going to like football. The equipment's $800, and, and they get into it in a month in, they want to quit. You're going, no, we, we paid good money for this. We can't take this stuff back. It's already used. you got to play football. Now, if it's like a rec league where they provide all the equipment, and a month in, the kid wants to quit, you're going, all right, no harm, no foul. Right? What's the difference? It's not your kid's attitude or his commitment issue, right? It's money. It's investment. Our heart is where we invest money into. All right, this is, this is a universal principle. All right, so, so when you're given a gift, you typically, now you appreciate the gift, but you don't protect it in the same way as if you actually invested your money into it. All right, so this is just, this is just how we are. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, so now let's think about this. If we were to actually give our treasure more to the advancement of the gospel, to the kingdom of God, to the other three billion people, and say, God, we want to we start making a difference in this world. I, I, I really, uh, knowing now that I'm one of the richest people on the stinking planet, and I'm doing this and that, like, I... I want my heart to be there. God, I have enough. I might convince myself that I don't have enough, but clearly, statistically, I have enough. So God, but my heart isn't there. Why is my heart not there? Because my wallet is with me. It's in my back pocket. So one of our first steps even in saying, God, I want a bigger heart for you, is saying, well, then I need to invest more in the kingdom of God. I, I want to I de start detaching my wallet from my own heart. And I want to say, God, it's, it's your wallet anyway. You've, you've given me all these things. I want my heart to be where your heart is, Lord. James 1.27 says, true religion is taking care of the orphan and the widow. Uh, it's, it's all the one another's in the word of God. Dozens of one another's. Love one another. Bless one another. Be generous to one another. All these things, spending our, our, our riches on other people for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the gospel. Saying, God, teach me, teach me, Lord, to have my treasure in heaven. How do I do that, Lord? How do I invest my treasure in heavenly things, eternal things, gospel things? How do I do it? Time, money, talent. How do I live my life as a pleasing sacrifice to you for the sake of the gospel? Now, again, this is going to look different for all of us. Okay? Some of you guys make more than others. Some of you guys are, are going paycheck to paycheck. Some of you guys have more excess. It's going to look different for everyone. So I'm saying there's not some, some rule or some code that we're all going to ascribe to in order to be obedient. All right? This is a hard issue between you and your God. But it's upon all of us to say, God, I, I want my treasure to be in heaven. And right now my treasure is in earthly things. And I'm treating the earth as if it's my future my, my home, my eternal home, this world, this life. In your notes, it says that the reality is we put our heart into the things that we're invested in, whether it's having the right job, the right status, a certain amount of money and savings, a nice car, a big enough house, or a nice enough house, or the right education. We find so much comfort in the gifts of God rather than finding comfort in God himself. We love the gifts more oftentimes than we love the giver of the gifts. So we ask ourselves these questions. Where do we spend our money? Let's look at our bank statements. Where, where, where do we clearly, what do we value clearly? We value lots of lattes. 
You know, we value, uh, well, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, okay? Every summer, you, you, look at, you look at my bank statement, you can see that I value baseball. I love going to games with my boys. I, I buy the online MLB.tv package. You know, it's like 120 bucks for the season or whatever. I value baseball. So you see that I, I, I value, for me, it's Dodgers. I'm sorry, okay? Uh, but I value the Dodger baseball, All right? So you see those things. Now, it doesn't mean that all these things are in and of themselves wrong, but I have to look at my, my bank statement and go, okay, it's good because I'm spending time with my family and my boys, but when is it too much? When is it excessive? When is it just becoming an idol and something that I'm just finding uh, some kind of joy that's, that's inordinate and it's, it's out of place? Where is that line? Now, this is what I'm saying. It's different for everyone, but I have to be honest with myself and say, is this money better spent somewhere else? Can I do different things with my boys that are more beneficial? Not that it's always wrong to go do these things with my boys, but how much is too much? What is the purpose for which I'm spending my money on these things? These are honest questions we have to ask and analyze our own hearts. What do you most want for your future? What is it that's in your heart? You go, I really want that in my future. Okay, that's where you're, that's where you're gonna put your treasure. You're gonna put your treasure wherever you want in your future. What do you believe that you need most for a good future? Where do you get comfort? You're gonna invest money into the things that give you comfort. Okay, you will, because you value it. How much is enough? At what point, honestly, will you have enough of these things? When will the house be nice enough? When will the car be new enough? When will you get enough acceptance? When will you have enough comfort from other things that aren't Jesus to where you'll finally actually be satisfied? When will it actually be enough? And the last question, when will Jesus be enough? Is Jesus enough for you? Is he really actually truly enough for you? We put so much stock in getting comfort from things. Somehow we've, we've bought this lie that it's the stuff that actually brings us comfort. It's the gifts of God that bring us comfort. Now, gifts of God are good things, they're gifts, but we've put so much stock in that. And then we start pushing back then when we start getting challenged because there's a good chance one of your little gods is kind of waking up a little bit from his little nap because he's been so dormant because you haven't been on the attack mode against these things. And now your flesh is hearing this and your spirit's kind of being awakened a little bit. And he's going, no, 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 that's, that's, this is not for you. You're fine. You're doing good. Your reasons for doing that are totally justified. That's for your, your, your spouse, you know, or whatever. All right, so, so you're totally doing good, but this is for your, your aunt, and you, you know how she's been spending money. It's just bad. Or this is for the friend. This is what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to start thinking about other people and their spending habits, but no, not ours. No, we're good. And we're going to start pushing back, and in your mind, you're going, okay, but Joby, this is great and all, but where's the balance in it all, okay? This is a good question. It's a good question. Where is the balance in it all? But here's the thing. I just want to give you a little, a little insight. When you start pushing back and trying to find the balance, and I'm not saying that don't find the balance, but what I'm saying is when you're trying to find the balance, it's usually because you're being offended. Because there's something inside you that's going, yeah, but what about this? Now, yes, good, good question. Find out between you and the Lord where, where does he wants to take you? What is that next step? You don't have to look like the person sitting next to you. But what's the next step? But when we usually, when our initial thought is, well, but, but yeah, I get that, but what about this? Usually that's us getting defensive because something is being wrestled with on the inside. Okay, now, and this is not just about money, this is about everything, you know? Anytime someone confronts you in sin and you go, well, but this, usually that, that, that pushback, that initial pushback, rather than a, wow, oh, gosh, this is really, I need to really pray through this and think about this and get in the word. And then after you get in the word and you go, okay, all right, all right. Okay, well, where's the balance? See, that, that's a totally different attitude, right? Is taking it in, taking the words of Jesus, going, okay, what does this mean for me? How does this affect my life? Okay, now where's the balance? That's a totally different attitude than your initial response going, okay, but what about this? So if, if that's your initial thing that's kind of rising up right now, this is what I'm asking you, embrace conviction. See it as a gift. And just say, God, you know what? Maybe Joby's totally off his rocker. Maybe he's not. I don't know. But God, show me first. 
Are you convicting me right now? Do you want some, some change in my life? Even if you end up totally thinking I'm nuts, at least go to God and say, are you bringing conviction to me? I tell you guys all the time, don't take my word for it, right? Get in the word, go home, get in the word, and read through these things. Say, God, what do you want me to do with these verses? I can't ignore them. I can't take out my black highlighter and just go whoop, 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 you know? Can't do that. You got to face these verses. You got to do something with them. And if you think that you're already doing this perfectly, you're, you're probably deceived. Probably got a blind spot. All right? So, so we go and we say, God, show me how I need to have my treasure in heaven in a different way, in a new way. How can I, how can I move forward? Uh, God, how much really is enough? Here, here's the answer to the question for, for us. When you look at the, the job, the money, the future, the home, the cars, how much is enough? Okay, our answer is always just a little bit more. All right, you'll, you'll get what you think is enough. Oh, I finally got the home. But then down the road, it's, man, you know, just, you know, if we just had that one extra bedroom, that, that, then that'd be enough. Gosh, you know, if we just got a few miles to the gallon extra, you know, we got this long commute then that'd be enough. You know, when we have our stuff, we're never satisfied. In, in Ecclesiastes chapter one, Solomon talks about this. He says, we amass things and we build up our little empire and it's just all vanity. It's all, it just, we, we build our empire and then we die and no one remembers us. No one remembers us. Uh, there was a theologian, his name's Count Zinzendorf, which is, first of all, super sweet name. <laughs> Count, Count Zinzendorf, I mean, come on. And he says this, this is his motto. He goes, that, that he wants this on his tombstone. And he goes, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. That's his hope for his life. That's my hope for my life. I hope I just preach the gospel, die, and then just be forgotten. I hope that my legacy is just simply Jesus, the kingdom of God. No one remembers my name in 100 years. I'm just gone, but I hopefully left my fingerprint on a bunch of other lives that did something for the gospel, and I'm never remembered. Because and I know even just from Solomon, we're not going to be remembered. Very rarely are people remembered. They're usually for really infamous things or really good things, but I just, I just want to preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. I want to invest my life in the kingdom of God. In your notes here, it says this, that God extends his extravagant grace so that we can extend his extravagant glory. Don't divorce the blessing of God from the purpose of God. Why has God made you one of the richest people on this planet? Start believing, first of all, that you are one of the richest people on the planet. Why has he chosen you to be born in America in the 20th century? Why? Was it just to amass comfort in this world? Was it to make this earth your heaven? Is that why he chose for you to be born in this, in this century, in this time and place, San Diego, California. Is this why he has you here? Or is there a greater purpose for why he has appointed you in this time, in this place? Is there a different purpose for that? Did God choose to make you one of the richest people on this planet for a different reason, for a greater reason, for a greater purpose? I, I clearly say yes, there is a different purpose than just amassing wealth for ourselves and doing more for us. Look what he says in verse 22, because we have to ask ourselves this, what if, what if God has actually given us so much so that we can give to other people, so we can actually be a blessing, as it says, the promise to Abraham, like we saw last week, to be a blessing to all families and nations on the earth. Maybe that's why he's given us so much. All right, look what he says in verse 22 here. The eye is the lamp of the body. Now, this, this little section seems a little out of place because we're talking about money and, and, and our heart being and our treasure in heaven. Then he talks about the eye being the lamp to the body. And he says, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Then he goes on and he says, goes back to the money thing, it seems like. It seems like he takes this little parenthetical break, like he just kind of went on a weird little rant. Then he comes back to money. No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. So we have this sandwich phrase in between about the light being the lamp. To the, like, what is that all about? He's talking about money, then this, then money. Well, here's the thing. He's still talking about money. 
What's he saying, though? What is this eye and the lamp thing? Okay, first of all, uh, in, in, to the Jews, the, the eye was an, another metaphorical picture for the heart, okay? It's the way you see life. It's your perspective. It's your lens by which you see life. So here's what Jesus is saying. Your eye is the lamp of the body. Your eye uh, is your perspective for how you live your life. What you see is, and how you see life is so important for how you live life. So if your eye, if your perspective If your perspective on specifically the context is money, if your perspective on your riches, if your perspective on why has God made you so rich, if your perspective on why has God given me all this money, if your perspective on why has God caused me to live in this this century, in this place, in this time and place, if your perspective is healthy, if your perspective is eternal, if your treasure is in heaven, not here on the earth, then your whole body will be full of light. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's saying the same thing in a different way. When your perspective on money is correct, you will have so much light inside of you because your heart will follow after that treasure. See what I'm saying? See what Jesus is saying here? So if your eye is bad, what's a word we can use here for bad eyesight? Blind spots, right? Right? If you've got blind spots that you're not addressing, if your eyesight is bad, your perspective is bad, if your perspective is blurry, if, there's, if you don't have clear picture of why God has given you treasure, then what happens to your life? Your whole body will be full of darkness. Darkness. This is bad news. That's why I say this is a salvation issue. Okay, our, our actions prove what's going on inside of us. Our actions prove what is going on inside of us. All right now, if your actions are full of darkness, but the thing is, guys, is because we're so used to our culture and our society, we, we actually think we're all okay. We think we're doing this, but we probably have major blind spots. So here's the thing. We usually think that money is only ever a blessing, don't we? I mean, can money possibly not be a blessing? Clearly, money is always a blessing. But no, for the rich young ruler, money was actually a stumbling block and actually prevented him from knowing and loving Jesus, right? So riches and treasure and money, it's not always a blessing, Because when it becomes a god or an idol or something that we get some value out of, and all of a sudden, now, as he says in the next phrase, now we've got two masters. We're trying to serve both. We're trying to serve God, the gospel, but we're also trying to serve our own comfort, trying to serve our own little dream. And if you do that, you're going to love one and hate the other. That's why this is a gospel issue. This is a salvation issue, guys. If, if, if If your heaven is here on earth and you're building up your little kingdom for here, for your purpose and for your glory, you're going to start spurning and despising the gospel because you're going to say, well, that's giving to the needy, giving to the poor, investing in those other three billion people. That's that's for the other people that are specially called, not for me. You're going to start spurning the work of the gospel in this world. You're going to hear uh, sermons and read texts about generosity and sacrifice, and you're going to spurn that. You're going to say, no, not for me. That's for, that's for the extremists. Those are the Jesus freaks. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm balanced. What, what does that mean? You have one foot in the world and one foot in the gospel? Is that balance? Sometimes balance isn't the right thing. Right? Clearly, that's not a good balance. One foot in the dock, one foot in the boat. No, get on the dock or get in the boat. Right? That's, that's bad balance. That's not gospel balance. Okay, sometimes God calls us to extremes, not just balance for the sake of balance. Now, again, what does this look like for you and for me? It's going to look different, but we've got to be honest with ourselves and honest before the Lord and honest with our friends and family and say, how can I, how, how do you see, what are the blind spots in my life with my finances? Am I spending too much here and there? Would you look at me and say that I'm, my treasure's in heaven? Or does it look more like my treasure's here on earth? Ask people. I, I, I dare you to ask someone. All right? In your community group this week, ask people. They know you the best. Ask them. Ask, all right, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go one higher than that. Ask your non-believing friends where they think your treasure is. See what they say. 
That'd be convicting. I don't even know if I'm going to do that. All right? I'm just going to dare you guys to do it. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to show you this. It's a great, great text here. And then we're going to close with just a little, a little challenge. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This was um, Paul writing to the Corinthian church. And, uh, and he's telling the Corinthian church about some folks in Macedonia. The Macedonian church was a very, very, very poor church. Okay, but here's what Paul's telling the Corinthians about the Macedonians. We, speaking on behalf of the other apostles, we want you guys to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches of Macedonia. In a severe test of affliction, okay, they were under a lot of duress, a lot of persecution. Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. It's like a church full of the widows from the story of the widow's might. That didn't just give 10%, but she gave everything she had. So this Macedonian church, so again, here's where we see Paul's using this uh, public demonstration of good deeds as a way to encourage others, okay? So that's where we're saying not all public service is bad. It's just, what are we doing it for? Why are we doing it? You know, so, so here he's letting the Corinthians know about how generous the Macedonians are being, even amidst their poverty. They're giving beyond their means. And I can testify that they're doing it beyond their means of their own accord. They're doing on their own. They're not being forced, not being coerced, not being guilted, on their own accord. And not only that, but look what verse 4 says. He says, they're begging us earnestly for the favor, the grace, is the same word favor, of taking part in the relief of the saints. So there were some needs among some other saints that were, uh, that were in extreme poverty. And so Paul was kind of sounding it out saying, hey guys, some other churches in another part of the region, you guys have never met them, but we want to help them, okay? Guys, this is why we go down to Mexico. This is why we go to Zambia. Because we're hearing the needs of the saints around the world. Paul's saying, you guys never met these Macedonians, but they're brothers and sisters in Christ, and they are suffering right now. Who wants to help? And so he's telling the Corinthians, guess what? The Macedonians who are so dirt poor, they're begging us that they can help these people who are even more poor than them. What's Paul saying? Guess what, Corinthians? The Macedonians, they're out giving you, and they're more poor than you. They have less than you. It's like a positive peer pressure that Paul's doing here because he wants to see the Corinthians. He's not trying to guilt them into it, but he's saying, guys, if you will give your treasure to this other church, then your heart will follow. Just like the the Macedonians are begging us that they can give the little bit that they have so that they can be a blessing to this other church that they've never met. They understood their role in this world is not just to amass, and they were in deep need If there's anyone who had reason to just keep everything, it was the Macedonians. But they said, no, these are our brothers and sisters. How could we sit back and watch? We have enough. It's not as much as you guys, but we have enough. And so they begged. They didn't ask the question, "What what do we have to do? What can we afford to do? They asked the question, what will it take for us to be a blessing? Not what can we afford. They didn't give out of their means. They give above and beyond their means for the sake of others. They begged. They begged. Begging us earnestly for the favor. It was was grace to them to give. Giving is a gift of grace because it unattaches us to the things of the world, the temporary things that, that moths kill and rust destroys. And this, not as we expected. It wasn't as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God, they gave themselves to us. They supplied for us so we could supply for others. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. Not obligation, but grace. It's a joy for them to give earnestly as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you. See that you excel in this act of grace also. He's saying, Corinthians, you guys... I want to see that you excel in this as well. This is a gift of grace to give. Corinthians, you are blessed so you can bless others. You've been given much so that you can supply for others. And he goes on and he actually talks about uh, how um, 
it, this is, uh, let me go down to um, verse 13 here. It says, I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened. Okay, this isn't the purpose. This is not like a spiritual welfare program. Right? It's not saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to support the, the church down in, in Mexico and over in Zambia so that they don't have to do any work. That's not what's going on here. This isn't spiritual welfare. All right, he's saying this. Your abundance, okay, it's a, it's a matter of, of fairness, okay? It's, it's trying to just be uh, spreading wealth around to the, the other churches that are also doing gospel work to help support them in their gospel work in their context. Your abundance at the present time should supply their need. If we have abundance, in Life Mission Church, we have abundance. Okay, I know you guys have abundance. We have abundance. We all have it. We're the richest in the world. So our abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply our need if we ever come into a place of need. They'll return the favor. Whether or not they ever do, it doesn't matter. Will, will the church in Mexico or Zambia ever get to a point where they're so overflowing with money that they start blessing us? Maybe. Crazier things have happened. But if they don't, it doesn't matter. We're going to take our abundance and we're going to bless others. As it's written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, right? We're going to gather much as a church. And I don't want to just fill a bank account. I want to have a purpose for every dollar that the Lord brings into this church. And we might save it for a certain time, for a couple years, whatever, but there's going to be a purpose for every dollar that, that comes into Life Mission Church. And it better be a gospel reason for what we spend that money on. I mean, if it's not, then you guys fire me and find someone else because I don't want to be spending our money on anything other than what's going to advance the gospel in this world. Okay, so everything that comes in to this church is going to be used for the advancement of the gospel. All right, and he says this, whoever gathered much, okay, that's us. We're a little church, guys, but we've gathered much. And I don't just mean money. I just mean the, 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 the gifts in this room, the, the hearts in this room. We have so much that God has given us. So we don't want anything left over. We want to give out all of our time, all of our treasure, all of our talents. We don't want to have excess. And whoever gathered little had no lack. Our hearts should break for the three billion people that only make $2 a day. And we say, we don't want them to lack. Lord, how can you use our wealth to be a blessing to all the families and all the nations on the earth? So then a challenge as we close here. In Romans chapter 1, verse 14, you don't have to go here, it's just one verse. But Paul says this, he goes, I'm in debt. Who's, who's Paul in debt to? He's not in debt to God, God gave him grace, right? Free gift. Who's Paul in debt to? Paul says, I'm in debt to the Jews and to the Gentiles. I owe this dying world my life. I owe them the gospel. Jesus, my Savior, saved me for a purpose. I owe Jesus nothing. That was a gift. But I owe the world everything. I owe this lost and dying world my life. He was sent to save, and he saved me to be sent. I am in debt. I am under obligation, he says, to both Jews and Gentiles. And this is why, he says in verse 15... This is why I am eager to preach the gospel to you. I want to pour my life out as a drink offering. I want to just spill my life pouring into you. I'm in debt. So church, there's going to be some people in our church, maybe in this room, maybe in the future, whatever. There's going to be some of you who are going to give everything for the gospel. You're going to sell everything. You're going to go. I, I totally believe that. We're not just going to be a little powwow church. But there's going to be people who are going to, you're going to, that, that Holy Spirit is just going to grab you and you're going to sell everything, you're going to go. And there's going to be others here that you're going to get that same Holy Spirit, just conviction and, and desire where you're saying, I want to change my life, I want to reorder my life, that even if I don't go overseas and live forever or whatever, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to give my life advancing the kingdom across the world. I'm going to change my spending habits. I'm going to change the way I pray. I'm going to start discipling people in the hopes that maybe one of them will go. But I'm not just going to sit back and let the people who go do all the work. I'm going to be here on the home front changing my life around because I know that I've been blessed so much I want to be a blessing to others. I want to be th th that Macedonian church. 
Okay, so my prayer for us is that we all get this, this Holy Spirit just conviction and empowering that says, God, help me to invest my treasure in heaven, that every single one of us are obeying the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. Whether you actually go to the nation or you're making disciples that go to the nations, we're, just, we're saying, God, just help me be obedient. Help me invest my time, treasure, and talents in the kingdom of God. So a few things that we can think about, some practical things. You can write these down. They're not in your notes. We have to believe, first of all, that generosity, gospel generosity, sacrifice, changing our lifestyle, this enables us to take part in a massive, God-sized, eternal uh, blessing of a life. Uh, Life Mission, we are a small church, but you have no idea. We have no idea what God can actually accomplish through our church if we actually believe the words of Jesus and we actually start doing the words of Jesus. If we start really believing that we are in the top five or 10% of the world's richest and we start saying we want to be like the Macedonian church, we have, we can not, I don't mean we like we, but like we as God's people, God working through us can do so much for the advancement of the gospel in this world. I believe that wholeheartedly, and I think we're going to. But it's going to take us saying, okay, God, I'm going to believe your words, and I'm going to start changing some stuff in my life. All right, so just a few, a few things, just for your next step to making this generous sacrifice, gospel sacrifice. Uh, one, you, you look at your own budget. You go, okay, I need to start knowing where every dollar is spent. Why? Because every dollar you spend is actually God's dollar. All right, are you being just kind of wishy-washy with their spending with God's money? Or are you really thinking through, okay, now again, this doesn't mean you can't go to baseball games or whatever. It's just, it's finding out, God, what, what is it that's gonna bring you glory? Because the, the reality is, is if I'm, being, uh, if I'm being responsible with this, me spending time with my boys and building memories for my boys is a good thing. I, but, but I have to find a, a context and, and, and really figure out what is the best time and money spent. So that's between you and God. And being honest, all right, and asking some people for some, some insight. And again, with your budget, you're saying, I want to do as I can, even if I don't do as I should. But you're going to do as you can. You're going to do the best that you can in really looking at your budget. You might look at your life and say, I need to downsize. I got some stuff I can sell or, or give away. You're going to give away to someone in need. You're going to sell it and then invest it into the kingdom of God. You might want to downsize, whatever it might be. You just you start looking around going, okay, what, am I, what, what do I not need? What, what's moth just going to eat and rust is going to eat up? You might be praying about taking certain steps of faith. Okay, this weekend, Saturday, it's a day trip. Matt's taking a team. There's five of us going down to Mexico. We're going to be going uh, to take a bunch of kids, orphans, to a water park. All right? Now everyone's going to be signing up. <laughs> okay, seriously, the, it, it seems like a small thing, like it's fun, but I'm telling you, you go and you, you step out in faith, you do as you can, even if it's not as you should, your motive might be to go to a water park, but you go down and the Lord grabs you. He gives you a picture for how you could be spending your life differently. It's one day, all right? Uh, talk to Matt, all right? If, if you saw in the, um, in the bulletin that there's a cost involved, if the money's an issue, don't, don't let that stop you from talking to Matt, okay? If you don't have the money, we'll, we'll figure that out, all right? I, I'm interested in your heart saying, God, I'm gonna take a little step of faith. I'm gonna go down. Now, you, you do need a passport, so, uh, but, but this is the kind of things, when we go down and do these things, sometimes it's building projects, so maybe you, maybe you didn't sign up because you thought it was gonna be a building project. Well, this is gonna be take kids to a water park, all right, hanging out with these orphans. I mean, does it, that's amazing. Okay, so it's not too late to sign up. It's next Saturday, all right? But it might be a step of faith saying, God, you know what? I'm just being so selfish with my time. And I just, I wanna give a, a day out of my month this, week, this, uh, this month to go down and do something like this, to play with these kids and show them a good time and love them. Show them that they're brothers and sisters in the richest country north, an hour away, are willing to take a day out of their time just to love them and play with them, it, your, your heart changes. Okay, it might be something like that. It might be, as Eric mentioned earlier, getting into a community group, saying, you know, I just need to take a little step and just being around and being discipled and, and just making friends. Okay, it might be that simple. 
Right? It's not even money related. It's just, it's just your heart. It's just your time. It's saying, I need to, I need to step in the eternal things of God. Because sometimes your treasure isn't just money. It's your, it's your time. Right? It's your schedule. Right? Or it might be serving. You know, you've been coming here for a while and, and you're enjoying the grace of God through the word of God and through the, the music and everything, but you're saying, okay, it's time for me to take a step and start serving. I want my, my treasure to be in heaven. Okay, guys, we've been so blessed as a church. We've got great, uh, great worship team. All right, we, we get to hear the gospel every single week, and that's not the case in every church. We've got people who are willing to open up their homes and lead community groups. We have been given much. You know what the word of God says about to those who much has been given? Much will be required. Much is required from us, Life Mission, because we've been given many great gifts of God, not just money, but people willing to open their homes and, and you know, preaching and worship and music. and all. We've been given so much as a young little church. Much is going to be required of us, and that, that excites me. I know it's scary. It scares me too. Don't, you know, it scares me. I'm not like a you know, superhero Christian guy. I'm scared too. All right. It says, whoever loses his life will gain it. So I just I know that's reality. I'm going to be losing my life here for the sake of gaining true life. It might also be something like this, giving financially to the church. 10% of all of what we give goes to outside missions and church planting. Okay, whether it's current missions or we're, we're putting money aside for future church plants, but that can't be touched for anything other than that. And I'm praying that as we continue to grow as a church, we, we up that percentage at some point. Who knows? I don't know what the Lord's going to do, but, but that's what we do. Okay, so I, I want you to know, too, that even just taking that step of faith, saying, I want to start giving, even if it's not what you should, but it's what you can. All right, it's taking that step where you're saying, God, I want my, my heart to become unattached to my wallet just a little bit, and maybe you'll, you'll do something in me that causes me to become more generous from a good motive. I want to close in prayer as we do that, just to remind you that we are not the end and the purpose of the gospel, but that God is. God's the end of the gospel. He is the, he's the, the target that we're aiming after. It's not our comfort. It's not our pleasure. It's God's glory. So, Lord, as we, as we come here and we, we thank you for all the crazy, amazing blessings you've given us, Lord, that stark reality that we are in this high percentage of the richest people on this planet, Lord, that you would bring that conviction that is scary and offensive, but also we know is good. That conviction that is liberating and freeing God, that you would give us a picture even as a church of what you can possibly do and accomplish through us. Though we are a small church and we, God, we, by maybe other standards, we don't have much, but Lord, you have blessed us abundantly. And we want to spend and invest our lives individually and corporately as a church. We want to spend our lives on the kingdom of God. We want to lay up our treasures in heaven where nothing can steal it, nothing can rob or destroy. And we want it to become obvious to other people in our lives, both believers and non-believers, that our treasures are in heaven. That would be an obvious thing. So God, I pray that as you've brought conviction, Lord, that you would also bring great encouragement to our church here to show them that as we are convicted in these things, that it is you really wanting to free us from serving money, serving treasure, serving comfort. Because as we lose our life, we will find it. And our joy will be full. We will be satisfied by the true bread of life, which is you, Jesus. Help us, Lord, to find that satisfaction, taking one step at a time, just doing the little things, not trying to compare ourselves to someone else, but just doing the little things, taking just the next step, and picking up our cross and following after you. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.